Hey everyone, welcome to Discover the OC. I'm Jules Wilson, your host and realtor, of course, here at Seven Gables Real Estate. And listen, I'm always trying to find people that can help make our lives better, bring value, some cool information, but it's even more exciting when I have a good friend. Yes. So good to have you. Yes. So great to be here with yeah. you. So this is Carol Roth. Now, for those of you who don't know Carol Roth, or I'm sure, I think everybody does know you, Carol, or wants to know yeah. you, whichever. We'll find, we'll find out. <laughs> Carol Roth is um, an award-winning uh, author, of course, New York Times bestselling author. She's also a TV host. She's been on Fox News, MSNBC, CNN. But there's three things that are my favorite things about you, Carol. Okay, here we go. Yes. You believe in small government. True. You believe in small business. True. But most importantly, you believe in the big hair. Big hair. <laughs> big hair. It's not small for the hair. <laughs> anyway, all kidding aside, I wanted to bring Carol on today because at the end of the day, so many of us, including me, a real, real estate agent, I am running a small business, right, Carol? And I love the fact that, well, your book, You Will Own Nothing, this scared me a little bit. You know what I mean, to tell you the truth. So just talking about the book for a minute, what was the inspiration for this and what can we take away from this book, right? Yeah, well, as you said, there are so many small businesses, 33 million-ish in the United States alone. Most of those are one-person businesses. Wow. Uh, a huge impact on the economy, about half the economy. But I really wrote You Will Own Nothing because people were struggling. They were doing the right things. They were saving and feeling like they couldn't get ahead. Right. And it felt like the American dream was slipping away. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about all of these issues. I wanted to talk about the emergence of social credit. I wanted to talk about things which, as a real estate agent, I'm sure resonates with you. Yeah. All these corporations were coming in and competing with families That's to buy right. houses. Right. I wanted to talk about the impact of technology. I wanted to talk about the Fed and inflation and government policy and how all of these things have been eating away at wealth and transferring wealth from Main Street to Wall Street. Yeah. And so I was looking for this wrapper, right? It's like, what, what's the through line from all of these different things that are going on? Right. And then I remembered this video that had made the rounds in social media. Some of you may have seen the, the memes. The You Will Own Nothing, which was from the World Economic Forum, those, you know, elite uh, folks right. that basically predicted for the year 2030, their number one prediction was that you will own nothing and you'll be happy. Oh, hell and I was so like, fun. yeah, so basically I was like, well, we know throughout history the people who own nothing have not had wealth because we know that owning things creates wealth. Right. And we know they haven't been happy. Right. right? So right. in many cases they starve to death. So I thought that was a really interesting thing to kind of play off of and then kind of dive deep into all these different areas and make sure while the elite may want you to own nothing, I want you to own everything. Right. I know you want people to own right. houses, right? Do, yeah. So we're, this is about ownership and fighting back and making sure that you do own assets so you can preserve wealth in the American dream. Okay, so I haven't read this yet. I just w went through some of the highlights, but when I read this book, Carol, and I know your wealth of information, will I actually have tools to help myself yes. that I can start using yes. right away? So the, the last chapter, the very last chapter, is that focus on owning everything. And I think the one thing I would say is, frankly, the, the feedback that I give you is not that different than I would give you in any circumstance. What's different is the lens that you view it through oh. and the urgency that you view it through. Okay. And it really is about how to think about your own financial situation, whether you have debt, whether you're investing, whether you haven't invested, and really change that lens to owning assets that have the opportunity to retain their value and appreciate the value. Okay, interesting. So I remember I saw the Disney movie, I think it was Ants or whatever it is. Uh, I think it was Ants. But they're all, they're one queen bee, that can be kind of considered the elite, let's face it. Right. And then they're all the same. They're, but what the reason why, in my opinion, that doesn't work with human beings is we're not ants. We weren't created no. to be sheep. No. We weren't created to be the same. So something, um, you know, my son's my real estate partner, Dylan, and one day he goes, well, mom, and I believe every, I believe the American dream, have a dream, go for it, accomplishment, work hard, anything's possible, right? Especially with God's self. So, I was hearing a lot about equity, the term equity. I'm like, okay, well, that sounds fine, I guess. I want everyone to have the fair chance. But then I thought, now, wait a second here. What's the difference between equity and equality? And I don't think a lot of people know. Sometimes, Carol, I feel like we are in the slow boil. 
Right. Do you know what I mean? I do. It's like the, the, the water's getting a little warmer, the sun's still shining, everything's even. The one, all of a sudden you're like, what? I'm drowning. But people don't realize it. So explain to people, I have a oh way my son explained to me, but explain to people the difference between equity and equality, why in my opinion, one's not good and the other's about opportunity. So equity is interesting because in a financial sense, equity is amazing. Equity is what you own in a house or a business, but that's not the equity that the sort of social justice warriors are talking about when they're conflating it with equality. So in a financial sense, you very much want to own equity. Sure. But in a social sense... Yeah, I'm not talking about real estate. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we're, we're just, we're, we're yeah. laying it out for everyone. Yeah. So the, on the other side, you have equality, which means that everybody is treated the same under the law yeah. and that everybody has access to the same types of opportunities if you're willing to do your part because you can't just have so outcomes outcome. without responsibilities, right? right? The rights and responsibilities go on the other side. So right. that's what we want. We want people to, to be able to take advantage of their God-given talents and you know whatever work that they want to put forth and whatever to accomplish. Right. Equity, on the other hand, which is this weasel word that they're using to confuse and conflate people, means that you have the same outcome. There's a really great short story, I don't know if you've read it, Jules, by Kurt Vonnegut called Harrison Bergeron. Harrison Bergeron. Okay. Harrison Bergeron, very famous story. And the point of the story was there were all these people with these fabulous talents. There was a, an athlete who was stronger than everyone, and a ballerina who was a better dancer. And in order to create equity, they had to penalize those people. Because the only way you can have the same outcome is by taking the unique talents and burning those, getting rid of those so that we work at the baseline common denominator level. So the guy who was really big and strong, they put extra weights on him so it was harder to do. And the ballerina, they blindfolded her. And it's a really great, very short story that really explains that differential and why we don't want to drive the outcomes. You cannot have the same outcomes because we don't have the same gifts. Right. We all have something different we bring to the table, which is what makes us fabulous. Like right. you said, as human beings, right. we're not those ants. Right. And you want Michael Jordan to shine as a basketball player. You right. want Beyonce to shine as a performer. Right. We don't want to say, I'm sorry, Beyonce, you're such a great performer. We're going to have to you know, take away your mic, put background music to make it sound worse, and, uh, you know, bind your legs together so you can't dance. That would be insane, but that's what equity would be in the performance because there are some people that's who don't have one. those talents. Right. So we want to have everybody have that opportunity and then have the outcome that goes along with that opportunity. Okay, so a lot of this, I love that analogy, by the way. God, now I'm going to be thinking about it, but that's a good one. Yeah, we don't all have the same gifts, so how can equity even be a thing? If, uh, really, right? Um, what about when it comes to the government, you talk a lot about small government. Tell me where that's coming from. And we're not, I just want to say one thing. We are not being political here. I don't believe in being political. I believe in being your best, having hopes and dreams. Right. But it's hard to do that if you're handcuffed to, in many ways. So, or if you're, uh, the ballerina's blindfolded, that's a good one. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so what about small government? Tell us why you're so passionate about that. Well, I'm passionate about that because I think that what has happened, that the way the government was set up was to be small and to let the free market determine, you know, us freely exchange ideas, decide where we want to shop, just decide how we want to spend our money, have the guardrails of somebody protecting property rights, including the, the playing field level, but not tipping the scale, not changing the rules of the game. Yeah. Unfortunately, through human nature, what happens is the government gets bigger, and then what do they do? They start granting favors, and they start changing that playing field. Well, who do you think it benefits? Do you think it benefits the 33 million small business owners like you, like the people who are watching, or do you think that it benefits the 20-so thousand big businesses that have the lobbying dollars that can mm -hmm. say, we can donate to your campaign, and we can affect your policies, and we'll scratch each other's back? Right. And unfortunately, that's really what's happened here is that we have cronyism that's taken place in what capitalism. Is I don't know that. So cronyism is when basically the government says, you know, we're close, so I'm going to give you a favor, I'm going to give you a tax break, I'm going to do these things because we're buddies, and then when it comes time, you're going to scratch my back. Oh, so okay. it's really giving things to your buddies or your cronies. Oh, okay, got And it. it's very different, again, than that, that free exchange. And unfortunately, the situation we're in now, not telling anyone things they don't know, 34 plus trillion dollars in debt, 
a trillion dollars being added every hundred days, deficits that are two deficits to GDP that are two times the historic average, right. um, all of these crazy things because of the expansion of the government, they're using that to continue to consolidate power. So if you feel like as a small business owner that it's just not as fair for you and that you have these big businesses that are lobbying for things like increasing the minimum wage mm -hmm. or you know implementing certain rules that they can comply with because they have lots of money in big legal departments but you can't right those are the things that we're trying to break down we want the barriers down so the small businesses can thrive so that everybody can participate in that american dream right not just those elite and well connected and frankly i mean you all saw this during COVID, right who got closed down it was the small businesses. Right. It wasn't based on data and science. Right. It was based on political clout and connections. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to avoid. The smaller the government, the less purview they have, the less ability they have to do things like yeah. that. Yeah. So what about AI? What's your what's your thoughts on that? So technology is interesting, right? Technology is great. It enhances our lives and it also creates a lot of disruption. <laughs> and I think AI and frankly, a lot of the digital tools that we're dealing with now um, have made tech businesses almost as powerful yeah. as the government. Right. I mean, you have these, sometimes it feels like a little more. Right. And, and sometimes they're working in concert. We had a lot of voices that were silenced during COVID because there was collusion right. between those. So I think that we have to be protective of our natural rights, our God-given rights, and make sure those are protected, not just against the government, but also in the digital sphere, whether it's your speech or your privacy or your intellectual property. You know, these AI models, they go out, they were to learn on my book, then they could basically take my style of writing and try to reproduce that. Right. Well, that's something that makes me unique. That's right. you know my own yeah. intellectual property. So I think we need to work with that. But at the same time, there are a lot of AI tools that can benefit you. We were just talking about one on Instagram that's yeah. great that can yeah. help you. You know, that's right. Pick clips and, and add your pictures. So I think we have to appreciate the benefits and also be concerned about the the issues that come along. But we can't stop it because if it's not going to be us, it's going yeah. to be the Chinese or it's going to be the Russians. That's right. And we want to make sure that we're at the forefront, but also making sure that our individual rights are protected. Right. Well, you know, I think for some people, they want just one person. What can I do? Really? So, Carol, how do you, I mean, I remember pre -COVID, after COVID, I thought things were out of control. I just felt like I don't have the choice anymore and stuff. We're just kind of, once again, kind of a slow boil. And sometimes, honestly, it can get depressing. I'll just yes. be honest, right? So. What do you do in your personal work or, or life or whatever to feel like you're taking control? What are you doing to prepare to protect your wealth, protect yourself, your freedom, whatever it might be? What do you yeah. do? So I think you know you can control only so many things, and the number one thing you can control is your life and ownership. No matter what they tell you, you young folks who are watching out there, when they say, "Oh, it's a YOLO life and you should be forever renters," no. You want to own things. That's the way that you create wealth and pass it on to people in your family. So you need to take control of your finances. Obviously, inflation has decimated a lot of people's lives. Austerity is not fun, mm -hmm. but if you have to give up some things in order to be able to save and to try to, to gain some of these assets and participate in that upside, mm -hmm. you have to make those personal changes and you have a lot of control over that. A place where people don't realize how much influence they have really is with some of these government issues, and particularly with small businesses getting involved in your local and state community, you can make a huge difference. A lot of the pushback that we're seeing is coming at the state Almost level. Almost like grassroots, really. So yes. don't think it doesn't work. It, and it does. We've had we've had a number of victories just in 2024 alone that has come because people took the time to send in an email, to pick up the phone, to call. And you have to remember these places, you know, these, these offices of state representatives and senators and whatnot, you know, they hear from 20 people in a day, all of a sudden that's an issue because they don't hear from people on a regular basis. So get your fellow business owners and call on things like this crazy Department of Labor anti-gig and anti-independent contractor rule. 
pick up the phone, make those phone calls and say this is unacceptable. You get a bunch of people and all of a sudden they're like, why are so many people calling us? Oh. And that all they care about is protecting themselves. So particularly people who are up for re-election, who are right. vulnerable, those are great places to shore up help and interest. And then also on a local level, I mean, this is places where we can affect change in terms of property taxes and spending and what's going on in your communities. And for small business, frankly, what's happening locally and on a state level is even more impactful in most cases than the federal government. There are a few things that have come out recently from the federal government that we're all trying to work uh, and, and kill, but this is where you can really make a change. Well, I'm so glad to hear that because I, I mean, I've had issues on that well, I should call, but I'm thinking, oh, I'm one call, who cares? I just thought you needed like 20,000 to make a difference. Now, You're saying 20 calls. 20, 20, 20 calls in one day. You get, like get, you, get, you get 19 of your friends. You call them one day. All of a sudden, they're going to think this is the biggest thing that's ever happened because 20 people are all calling them in the span of three hours. Carol, this is such good news. Yeah. It 20 is. people is big. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so excited to hear that. Well, one thing about Orange County, listen, we are blessed. Yes. Honestly, I was driving down um, the 55th Avenue. There's the biggest sign that says, I'm paraphrasing, but not here in Orange County. We break <laughs> the law, we will prosper. Right. Have you seen that? No, but I love it. Uh, right. And I heard uh, Mayor Will O'Neill speak yesterday and even about the ferry. They're trying to keep Orange County the way Orange County is the for the people, right? Yes. So when I heard him speak and what you're just saying, okay, we're going to get on the phone and start calling and, and let people know that what call does make a difference. It I'm does. Just, I'll be honest, Carol, I assumed it didn't. So, shame on me. I mean, they, they still need to be reelected. They still need to get their dollars. They don't want to be shamed publicly on social media. Oh. So, you guys, the, these are the tools that you have to fight back. I love and it. And we should be implementing them up because we, we've had some real wins, things like natural asset companies and like yeah. this year. So Okay, so another thing, ownership. Now, you know me, Carol. I was born and raised in real estate, but I do not consider myself a salesy realtor. I don't even like that idea. Yes. But I believe in ownership too. Yes. Because uh -huh. to me, ownership represents freedom. It re is an element of freedom, right? And I, I've, I've had certain clients say to me, well, you know, I don't really want to have a house payment. And as respectfully as possible, I so say, you don't understand. There's no free lunch program. Either it's your house payment or it's your landlord's house payment that you're making. Right. Who do you want to pay to? I'd rather pay myself. So I really, really encourage that. All It's all about freedom for me. Yeah, so let, let me add to that because yeah. that's such an important point. First of all, I think people don't realize that the largest asset on most homes balance, or most household balance sheets uh, in the United States is the house. This is how families create generational wealth. Mm -hmm. My own personal theory on this is because you're consuming it, you're not checking like a stock price every day, so it goes up and down. You're not like, oh, I have to sell this and get a new one. This is a, a long-term venue, and that's how you accumulate wealth over long periods of time. Right. So it's important from that, but the freedom part is becoming even more and more important right. because you are master of your own domain. Do a little Seinfeld reference there, but in a very different way. And, and if you own a house, nobody can tell you what to do inside that house, yeah. you know, other than government housing association, but like in terms of some of these crazy things that are going on with no gas stoves right. and no ammunition or whatnot, you know, if you have a, a Wall Street landlord, which is what is happening, then they can easily say, I'm sorry, this is our policy. We can't allow you to do that. Yeah. But if it's your house, yeah. They can't tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, Carol, I, you have done so many things. And one thing I love about so you're a Midwestern girl. I am. You're a Midwestern girl with, I'm going to call it East Coast Savvy. That's kind of what you are. <laughs> we, we, we say it's a, it's a blue collar heart and an Ivy League education. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the best yeah. model because you understand. You understand, uh, I don't know, I think you're just, you're just like an average person with big dreams. Isn't that everybody? I, that's, I mean, that's where pretty much everybody in this country, with that, the exception of a handful of people, yeah. that's it. And then you want to do better than your parents, and that's the American dream, is just right. setting up that success for the next generation. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have a, a new generation of young folks who don't feel that way, no. and we need to make sure that they have that Yeah, you always feel better working. One yeah. thing about you, Carol, is, once again, you went to Wharton, you're a TV host, a, an author. Okay, you didn't write this book by sitting around. Do you know what I mean? You didn't go to Wharton by sitting around. So you have the blue collar roots, but um, I love the fact that you work, you went for it, you have dreams. I mean, this is not easy, write all the books you do and I'm going all over the place, but don't you feel better about yourself when you accomplish 
Right, I love it. I mean, it's art. Everything that we do, if you own a small business, your business is art. If you're writing words, it's art. If you're painting, everybody knows that's art, but people don't think of these other things. It's, it's how you're producing, it's what you're adding value to the world and to your day, it's yeah. part of your identity. It's such a wonderful blessing that we have the opportunity to choose that. Think about it. this is one of the first times in history, you know, the last, call it 70 years, where people can pick how it is that they earn a living and sustain yeah. themselves and do that with meaning, creating meaning and impact in their communities. Mm. It's really beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Well, Carol, how can people, I'm so blessed that we're friends and I got yes. to know you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, but how can people get a hold of you or check you out or whatever? Sure, so I have a website and a personal newsletter. You can sign up at carolroth.com slash news. And across social media, if you've got a warped sense of humor and you dare go there, I'm at Carol J.S. Roth. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Carol. Appreciate you. And um, any questions you might have for Carol, you can always uh, go to Instagram and, and send me a message. And I think I have a little inside information where I might be able to get the answer for you. <laughs> thank you, Carol. You're awesome. Thanks. And make sure you check out her book. You will own nothing. Like she said at the end of the book, there's some good nuggets on uh, real life things you can do. So, and it's their first step towards ownership. Get yeah. a hard copy of the book, you own that. They can't take it from you. There me. you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carol.